You're listening to episode 49 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Carrie Natwick about the gut brain connection and how your gut health impacts your brain health. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm a registered dietitian and coach trained in functional medicine with a passion for helping women just like you ditch perfectionism and use food, fitness, and self-care to fuel your bigger God-given purpose. I believe that it's possible to achieve your biggest life-changing goals without the frustration, obsession, or negative self-talk that so many women subject themselves to every day. All you need are the right tools, the right mindset, and the faith to turn your dreams into reality. I'm here to guide you along the way. The truth is that you are so much more than a body, and I'm on a mission to help you change the way you think and act at a core beliefs level so you can transform your physical, mental, and spiritual health from the inside out. Are you ready to become fed and fearless in your pursuit of a healthy, meaningful life? Welcome to the Fed and Fearless Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld. I'm your host as always. And we have a really special guest today, special to me because our guest is someone who I've been working with for about nine months now as one of my business mastermind clients. I'm her business coach. And most of the time when I'm talking to this person, it's in a business coaching capacity. But today I got to learn from her about her area of expertise, her area of interest and passion, which is the gut brain connection. So I'm very, very happy to have with us today, Carrie Natwick. Carrie is a registered dietitian nutritionist and an integrative and functional nutrition certified practitioner. She uses an integrative and functional nutrition model in working with patients and specializes in gastrointestinal related disorders and eating disorders. She's trained in intuitive eating, she's trauma-informed, and she incorporates mindfulness-based approaches into her patient's care. She's also the proud mother of a 10-year-old son named Levi, who, fun fact, has the same name as my dog, and Levi has dyslexia and dysgraphia. In her free time, she can be found in nature, walking her dog timber, hiking, snowshoeing, backpacking, and paddleboarding. She has enjoyed traveling internationally for over 20 years and has ventured to Europe, Southeast Asia, and South America. She's also a master gardener and places a tremendous value on the vital connection between the land and our health. Carrie is one of my favorite clients, partially because she's so sweet and so fun and so kind, but also partially because I just love how diverse her interests are. And it's been really, really cool to be able to watch her over the past nine months, get more focused in her interests. And I am just really excited for you guys to get to learn from her about the gut brain connection, which is the topic that she has really been focusing on with her clients and the business that she's building. And she's just got so much wisdom and knowledge to share about all the different ways that your gut and your brain can be connected and intertwined and the different methods for improving the gut brain axis and making sure that not only your gut is being taken care of, but also that your brain is part of the equation as well. So it's a really interesting conversation that we have. Super pumped to have her on the show. And I can't wait for you to get to know her and get to hear her expertise. So without further ado, here is Carrie Natwick. All right, everybody. I am so excited to have with me on the show today, Carrie Natwick. Welcome to the show, Carrie. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. And I have the pleasure of talking with Carrie at least once a month because she is in my mastermind for nutrition business owners. And I'm just super excited to finally be having her on the show to share her expertise around gut health and how gut health affects the brain and all the stuff that she has so much knowledge on. And it's just really been awesome to see not only her business explode because she's so good at what she does, but also uh, just how clear she's gotten on what she is passionate about. So I'm excited that she's here to share it with you because I know that she's got a lot of wisdom to share and uh, has a lot of interesting knowledge on gut health and all the different things that, that can affect it. So 
just for anyone that doesn't know you, that is one of our listeners, I'd love to hear your story and specifically what led you to become so passionate about gut health and the influence of gut health on brain health. Yeah, absolutely. So, and before I start, Laura, I have to put in a plug for what an amazing business coach you are. You, It's because of your help and your guidance and your wisdom and your patience with me that I feel like I, I'm really able to pursue my passions as a dietitian and really got clear with myself about this passion of gut health and especially the gut brain um, connection. So I, I just want to put in a plug for you. You're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I've been a dietitian for 20 years and, you know, without me really realizing it at the time, when I got married to my husband, um, he had IBS, but like so many people who have IBS, it, he had lived with it for so long. He had seen multiple doctors and he, he just thought that it was just something that would just was like, he just had to, he just kind of had to roll with it in his life. And so he and I have been together for like 13 years now. And it wasn't until the last five years when I started doing more intensive study in integrative and functional nutrition and medicine, that I started to learn more about the health of the gut and how, people who suffer from things like IBS or that all of these different health conditions, anything connected to, for example, autoimmune conditions or even anxiety and depression. I mean, people who have IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, people who have reflux, the gut is connected to so much. It's, it's really the seat of our health. It's like the most important component that really dictates who we are are in terms of being a healthy person. And so through this study of integrative and functional nutrition, learning about gut health, um, you know, I was finally able to, as a dietitian, be able to help my husband who had been struggling with, you know, IBS for, I don't know, probably 15 years at that point. And so that, that really, you know, kind of launched me into a space where I started, like I said, learning more about how the gut is connected to so many of the different systems in our body, how it's really the seat of so many of the different components of um, who we are in terms of our health. And, um, and I just, you know, I just feel like it's the most important thing. So I'm like, I really want to help people with this. What is it about the gut brain connection that, I mean, I know it's, it's one of these things that I think the more you learn about it, it's like, you just find out all of the different ways that the gut can affect your health. But what is it about the gut brain connection that creates that passion for you? So I think one of the main things is that what I see in my patients, in so many of my patients, they have, they experience things like um, anxiety and depression, cognitive decline, memory issues. Um, and people often think that there's something wrong with my brain. And what, what, like in the work that I've been able to do with my patients is that once you fix the gut, you can fix the brain. And, you know, I think that people need to realize that this, that our gut and our brain are constantly communicating through this bi-directional pathway called the gut brain access. And, you know, depending on what's happening with the gut microbiota um, in terms of, you know, both abundance and diversity of, of the types of strains of bacteria that are living within the gut microbiota, depending on things like whether or not you have dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of, you know, of those good, supposed to call them good and bad bacteria, um, you know, all of those things can really impact our brain health. And so the majority of patients that I work with, um, they, they have anxiety because they have gut issues, they have depression. And so it's amazing. And it's so powerful and empowering to see what can happen for people when they heal the gut, that they're healing their brain. So it sounds like what you're saying is that there's a lot of people out there that have neurological and emotional type symptoms like anxiety, depression. Um, I don't know if we're thinking about things like cognitive dysfunction, um, but people that have those symptoms, a lot of times they're thinking more about what's wrong with my brain and how do I fix my brain? But you're saying that a lot of these people that have those symptoms actually have issues 
in their gut that if they were to fix their gut issues, they would see improvement in their brain health. So can you talk a little bit of, a little bit more about the gut brain axis for those listeners who don't know what that is? And how does that end up affecting brain health when you have something wrong in your gut? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the key concepts in, in how gut health affects brain health is to think about the gut brain, what's known as the gut brain access. Um, the gut is actually referred to as the second brain in our body because there's, there's actually just as there's a hundred million neurons that are lining the entire gastrointestinal tract. And how the brain is connected to the gut is through the, uh, a nerve that's called the vagus nerve. And this is kind of the command center for this bi-directional communication pathway. So, um, so, as, so these, two, these two systems in our body, our gut and our brain, are communicating all of the time. And so when, when your gut, when you either have you know, um, damage that's done to the lining of the gut that results in some Thing called intestinal permeability or leaky gut, or when you have dysbiosis, again, you know, not a not a, an abundance of these healthy microbes or a, a you know a great diversity of these microbes in the gut. Um, what ends up ha- happening is that. Um, you'll start to see manifestations of how this imbalance in the gut will result in things like brain dysfunctions. The other key component to the connection between the gut brain access is that many people think that the neurotransmitters that are that are involved with things like mood, like how we feel. So things like serotonin or neurotransmitters like GABA that promote that calm and relaxation. Many people think they're, they're, they're produced in the brain, but the fact of the matter is, is that the majority of neurotransmitters, especially serotonin is produced, which is that happy, feel good neuro neurotransmitter is actually produced in the gut. So again, this, the importance of having a healthy gut microbiota, having, you know, a healthy, a healthy gut that, um, where the, the lining of the gut is intact, where you, you don't suffer from things like leaky gut. Um, it's all, going to impact the brain and it's going to impact mood it's going to impact memory um and you know and even cognitive function i actually don't think i knew that fact about the hundred thousand neurons in the gut itself which is pretty wild so um, most people when they think about neurons they're thinking about the brain and then maybe they think about the spinal cord or like the nervous system but it sounds like um the gut is really such a integral part of the nervous system that if that if it's producing all these neurotransmitters if there's something wrong with that production then the brain is not going to function the way it needs to function yeah absolutely and that's where that enteric nervous system and the central nervous system you know they're really working you know side by side and that you know that enteric nervous system that is you know it's housed within the entire the entire gut so um yeah they're they're really important they you know they really kind of work in this like in this partnership Mm -hmm. now I feel like when we talk about gut issues, a lot of times people are thinking about things like bloating, reflux, constipation, diarrhea, those more obvious gut symptoms. What if somebody doesn't have those symptoms? Is there anything they should be looking for to know that their gut still needs some attention? Absolutely. <laughs> and again, this just kind of goes back to the thing I was saying at the beginning, which is that the gut is really the seat of our health. So, you know, it's really like there's some really there's kind of there's a whole preponderance of of um, research and information where we're constantly learning about um, the importance of the gut. And um, and you know, like things like, you know, now we're starting to recognize that gut our gut health is connected to or hormone hormonal health that the gut is connected to cardiovascular health. Um, you know, there's been a lot of research that shows that people who suffer from chronic diseases, things like, you know, diabetes, even, you know, um, people who carry more weight for their body than they should and have difficulty losing weight, um, any lip, lipid abnormalities, people who have even cancer, PCOS, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. These are all conditions 
organs that um, that are connected to uh, again the health of the gut, both in terms of the um, the health of the lining of the gut as well as the gut microbiome. Mm-hmm. So it kind of sounds like what you're saying is that if you have any health condition at all, like any sort of symptoms, that at least evaluating gut health should be part of the conversation with whatever practitioner you're working with. Yeah, that's a, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. Cause I feel like so many times people, they don't even, they don't even understand that there could be something wrong with their gut if they're not having those symptoms and to try to convince them that, Hey, we need to do some testing or we need to do some like gut healing protocols to get things back on track Do you ever find that there's resistance to that with your clients or is it just like they trust you and they're ready to jump into whatever you tell them to do? I think it's both. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I've definitely had experiences with both with people, but you know, I also think that, you know, sometimes when we're working on gut health, you know, we're really trying to delve into what some of the root causes are of, of gut health. And, you know, oftentimes the root causes of gut health, there can be changes that can be made that can, that will also coincide, you know, with the treatment or, you know, functional medicine, um, you know, food is medicine and interventions for many, you know, of those chronic diseases that I, that I just listed. And so, you know, when we start talking about, you know, making changes, moving away from things like processed food and moving towards a whole food, you know, plant-based diet, or trying to remove things like alcohol, talking about increasing things like fiber in the diet, you know, reviewing the types of, you know, medications that people have been on, um, And then even delving into the realm of talking about things like environmental toxins or irritants or um, maybe heavy metals, Um, you know, talking about things like chronic stress, you know, those are areas that I might as an integrative and functional, you know, dietitian delve into with just about any one of my patients, you know, and when we're addressing those, we're really talking about gut health, you know, we're in, in removing a lot of those, you know, potential kind of triggers for people, um, Um, for the development of leaky gut and for the development of dysbiosis, we're not only going to, you know, heal and repair the gut, but we're also going to be, you know, making gains in terms of, you know, addressing some of um, the issues that really coincide with a lot of those chronic diseases as well. And of course, you know, as a dietitian, you know, my belief is just that food is medicine is just one of the most important, you know, interventions that we can be talking about, which also proves true in the realm of, you know, gut health. It's funny. This is a complete, well, I don't want to say it's a tangent. It's, it's relevant to the date that we're recording this. I don't know if you happen to, and you may not be on Instagram so much. And if you are on Instagram, I would question whether you're following Justin Bieber. Um, but did you, (laughs) did you, Laura, I'm not actually, you're not, oh my gosh, you're not following Justin Bieber. I'm not following Justin Bieber. I'm on Instagram. I'm not following Justin Bieber. Well, and (laughs) Full disclosure, I am not either following Justin Bieber, but um, one of my friends had posted a, he had put a post on Instagram, I think it was like in the last couple of weeks, where he said, like the, the post itself said that food is medicine. And if you're experiencing things like anxiety or depression, that you should maybe think about looking at your diet as being a, a part of the solution. And there was this like big backlash because of course, anything Justin Bieber says is probably like open, open season. Um, But there was this really big backlash, specifically from this one UK doctor who I've seen him talk a lot about. um, He's kind of in the whole like health at every size, food access, uh, like, not everybody can eat healthy food. So stop telling people to eat healthy or stop shaming people, which again, I don't think Justin was shaming anyone. He was just saying, if if you're feeling this way, your diet might be playing a role. Um, But it was just this really interesting controversy because basically Justin got like blasted for saying that phrase that food is medicine. And I just think it's really interesting, especially in, in 2020 where, you know, we're dealing with this major health crisis. And the more we find out about this crisis, the more we find out that this underlying general, you know, lack of health and a lot of these conditions that are actually caused by poor diet, which again, I'm not blaming anybody and saying, oh, you're, you know, you're a failure human because you're not eating well. We have a food environment that really pushes 
unhealthy food. It actually is is a a pretty big act of um, rebellion to be eating a healthy diet. I just think it's really interesting that there is this controversy over the phrase food as medicine. So do you have any thoughts about that? I know I didn't really, I didn't prepare you for that question, but you just made me think of that Justin Bieber (laughs) issue. And I was just like, dude, like lay off Justin. Like he didn't say go off your meds and eat fruit and vegetables or something. He said, maybe look at your diet if you're having these symptoms. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think that there's, it's, it's really baffling to me that, like you said, in 2020, that people still don't make the connection between diet and chronic disease, or that people don't make the connection between diet and and gut health. I mean, again, just look at, look at the literature, you know, look at the research. It's, it's just, it's irrefutable, this connection between what we put into our bodies and how our bodies views that as information and how it's, you know, it's directly connected to, you know, how we feel and how well our brain functions and how well our immune system functions and, you know, how well we're absorbing nutrients because of gut health and how, you know, what are, what we weigh and chronic diseases that we develop. I mean, there's just, there's just so much information out there now that is, is proven over and over again in research that, I mean, I I don't really understand what it's about when people, you know, are, are, I I don't know, I I guess I just can't help but question whether or not like big pharma is behind things like that, where, you know, in conventional medicine and in so many places in the world, it's like, we look at the approach around, you know, treating chronic illness as a pill for every ill, when the majority of diseases that people are suffering from are chronic diseases that have interventions with through lifestyle, through what we eat, you know, how through how we regulate stress, through how much we're moving our bodies. Um, you know, there's, there's just, there's so many things that we can do in terms of prevention um, that I think would make us all a healthier population, you know, as a whole, and it would have a huge impact. So it's, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I'll have to send you the post later. Cause uh, yeah, you will. <laughs> it's like exactly, <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. We'll, we'll get you hooked up with Justin. Um, yeah, let's do it. So you've mentioned, <laughs> And you've mentioned a lot of different root causes that you look at when you're working with clients. And I'm wondering if there's a couple that you could point out as being like the most important or maybe the, the first places to look. Um, I know that it can be really complex and really um, individual. Obviously, everybody's got a different situation, yeah. different root cause. But are there any mm-hmm. are there any more common root causes that you see being pretty consistent across the people that you work with? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that occurs to me 100%, especially in the time of COVID is stress. Like, <laughs> I mean, everybody is so stressed out. I mean, I, I can just think of all of my mom friends who are now trying to work, working full time, working from home, you know, managing all of the passwords for their kids and trying to figure out schedules for, you know, online schooling as just one example of, you know, how our life, it feels like, nobody is untouched in the realm of stress by this. And, you know, and so stress, it has a huge impact on the gut. And, you know, one of the reasons or one of the ways that it does that is when we're stressed out, our body goes into a sympathetic nervous state, which is like that state of the, of our autonomic nervous system, where our body thinks we're being chased by a saber toothed tiger. And one of the responses to that is that our body increases the production of cortisol and cortisol. It's a stress hormone. It's, you know, it's, it serves a purpose as long long as we're not constantly producing it, but when we're under chronic states of stress, like most people are, and a cortisol can degrade the lining of, of the gut. It can also, you know, suppress the immune system. It's also one of those, um, it's also connected to things like, you know, it's a lipophilic hormone that causes deposition of fat around our midsections. Um, so, you know, this, like this whole, like, you know, COVID weight gain thing, you know, most of that from my opinion is really connected to the stress for people. And so, you know, one of the big tools, 
schools. Again, this is, you know, this can apply to, you know, people trying to manage chronic disease, but especially in the realm of gut health and is so connected to the gut brain access is teaching people tools for stress management. And, you know, one of the ways that I find to be the most effective for people is this kind of portal that we all have access to that is like, it's one of the most effective kind of connections to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and digest or that relax can, you know, component or of our, of our nervous system is the breath. And so teaching people breath work, you know, teaching people how to create, you know, promote pauses in their day, um, learning how to use different breathing techniques. It's, it's one of the easiest ways and, and easy, and I say easy, but, you know, it truly is, it's accessible to everybody to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. And when that parasympathetic nervous system is engaged, which is that rest and, you know, relax, or the, some people will call it the rest and digest component of our nervous system. It's not only, it, it not only has that impact on gut health by promoting, you know, a greater diversity, it, it doesn't promote any damage to the lining of our gut, but it also helps us when we're in that relaxed state, especially while we're eating, it will, it will actually train our bodies to, you know, to actually upregulate and produce more of the supports that we need when we're eating meals. So things like hydrochloric acid production, things like pancreatic enzymes, even bile, you know, those, those digestive supports that are so important and critical for helping us digest our food and break down our food are increased when we're in a relaxed state prior to eating food. Um, and when we're in a relaxed state, there's really interesting research too, that shows us that we actually, we actually mine or harvest more of the nutrients from our food. Um, and so it, so really, so managing stress is, I think one of, one of the biggest things that we can do, I think using breath is a really great tool that people people can access that we all have access to. Um, and then obviously other things are going to be, um, things that I like to talk to my patients about are just getting outside, you know, just connecting to nature. It's one of the, again, a very simple yet powerful strategy for, you know, reducing stress. Um, having exposure to natural light is also huge. And I've spent, you know, many years of my life living in Alaska and, you know, oddly enough, so many of my office when I lived in Alaska didn't have windows and it was awful. It was like one of the most health degrading kind of moments of my life. So I could truly understand like the impact that, that not having access to natural light or not being intentional about that. I understand like what, what kind of an impact that can have, um, you know, on, on stress and just our overall, um, overall sense of well being and, and our health. And then of course, you know, there's so many other tools, things like, you know, oftentimes patients that I work with, we talk about even mindset shifts, you know, time management, um, you know, strategies, um, you know, just helping people feel like they're in charge of their life. And again, all of these components are so, you know, deeply tied to our, you know, to health and to gut health. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I'm trying to imagine, because I know Alaska is like, you get into phases of the year where it's dark for almost the whole day. Yes. How many hours of the day would it be the darkest? Um, well, in certain places, like if you get up north of the Arctic Circle, you it can be dark for three months out of the year, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is completely in, insane. I mean, just like it's it definitely requires. I, I mean, I'm always in awe of people that are able to live in those conditions. But where I lived, I was living in southeast Alaska um, for, you know, on and off for like 10 years, 15 years, um, you know, the longest the, or the shortest day was a four hour, you know, kind of like low on the horizon sun. It almost felt like dusk most of the day at winter solstice. And so we'd see the, see the sun kind of rise and go from like between mountain peak to mountain peak, and then it would be gone again. And then we'd be in like dusk and dark for the majority of the day. So you, you know, people that live in Alaska and most, many of my patients live in Alaska. We talk about strategies of really planning your day and planning your time 
around getting outside when it's when you can have access to natural light because it's it's really important for um, signaling to your body for you know hormonal balance for you know sleep and circadian rhythm balance so I don't I don't know if I could handle that I'm very like I have um, there's this concept called chronotypes and there's four different chronotypes um, and one of them is the most common it's the one that's based on the light and dark cycles more of the you know active during the day you're not really a night owl but you're not really like a early bird either you're really like peak energy during the middle of the day and I don't think I could handle no. a four hour window of <laughs> partial light. I think I would it's, go crazy. It's so. rough. I think one of the best strategies is just booking a plane ticket and getting out of there for a while. Go, go fly to Hawaii. To, yeah, I was going to say Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is going to be a little bit of a left turn, but something that I know you're super passionate about. And actually, I remember at our mastermind event, you were talking with some of the other women a lot about this. So I know that you're passionate about it. And it's something that I don't, I don't think gets talked about very often. And that's the connection between health and especially gut health and trauma. So I know that you are trauma informed in the work that you do. Can you talk a little bit about what does it mean to be trauma informed as a dietitian? And why is that so important when you're working with someone with gut issues? Yeah. So what trauma informed means is that I, you know, first of all, have had training as a um, just in in the field of trauma and, you know, what impacts trauma, what causes trauma. Um, I've also done work with the Center for Mind Body Medicine, um, you know, where we we learned a lot about um, trauma and the impact on the brain, which, of course, is connected to the gut. Right. Um, and, you know, what else, and what the Center for Mind body medicine does is they go to you know different places throughout the entire world you know they've been in obviously like the middle east you know for example they were down in sonoma county during all of the fires and now i mean now there's more fires that are happening in that in the region of northern california um they've been in israel they've just they've been everywhere and you know what they what they do is they use kind of like ancestral and tribal interventions for helping people work through trauma. And one of the, one of the things that we know is that, you know, when you're, when you experience a state of trauma or when you experience trauma, your body goes into, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And sometimes your, your body can actually kind of get stuck in that state where like it your in your sympathetic nervous system for instance is kind of like the like the gas pedal is just on the floor all the time and you're always feeling like under stress or you can get stuck in freeze mode where all of a sudden you know you're 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 kind of paralyzed in life like you you can't make decisions you can't really like you have no motivation for moving forward um and some people are are in that fight state where they're they're just always feeling like they having they're having to battle and so you know what we know it, like through the work that has been done with Dr. Jim Jim Gordon is that there's a lot of in, you know, a lot of knowledge and wisdom that we can draw from our ancestors on how to move trauma through the body. And, you know, one of the ways that we do this is, again, that breath portal is incredibly important, again, because of, you know, the impact that it has on our ability to connect with the parasympathetic nervous system and how that impacts things like gut health, but also some really interesting kind of techniques that he talks taught us things like, um, like shaking and, and, and dancing and, you know, being able to use music and rhythms and beats and be able to move your body in a way that transfers that trauma that we kind of, that we hold almost at the cellular level and to be able to move it through our body and to be able to release it. And, you know, it's interesting in the work that, you know, I do, I work with a lot of individuals who have eating disorders, uh, you know, for a lot of people with eating disorders, there's a history of trauma that, um, you know, that can be part of the trigger to an eating disorder. 
And um, one of the things that is in terms of gut health, this kind of gut brain connection, one of the things that I often see is poor gut motility. And that's because when um, when people experience trauma, it can actually like cause almost damage that vagus nerve. So it can cause like a stasis or like a slowing of that vagus nerve. And when that vagus nerve is almost like paralyzed in a way, that connection between the gut and the brain goes away. So, you know, again, when we start eating those, that signaling around, you know, producing digestive support isn't there. The ability to move food through the gut, you know, it's like, isn't there. So I, so a lot of these patients have things like constipation, they suffer from things like bloating, um, gas, you know, more than, more than a lot of other patients that I work with. And so, you know, being able to really incorporate and integrate holistic services where, um, you know, where we're, well, first of all, that they have some kind of therapy, that they have access to their breath, that they're able to engage with their parasympathetic nervous system, um, that they're also maybe, you know, accessing other um, mind-body modalities. So, you know, incorporating things like yoga and Tai Chi. Um, also things like, you know, in like even things like taking cold showers, you know, or doing like, you know, like cold plunges can really help to support and activate the vagus nerve. So there's a lot of different kind of modalities and, and strategies that, you know, we'll use with patients where, you know, there's that, you know, suspicion of just that kind of like that severing of that communication between the gut and the brain. Um, and then of course, in conjunction with providing with the right support around trauma and, you know, helping them to, you know, come up with strategies for moving the trauma from their body, getting stored in their body at that cellular level and moving it through and being able to release it. It can be really, really powerful for people. That's awesome. And it's so interesting to me, just the physical element of trauma and how even if you're not actively thinking about what happened or you feel like you've moved on from it, like from a maybe you did therapy and you feel like mentally you're not like still there. It's crazy how your body can just get stuck in that that, like you said, the fight or flight response. And I think it's really cool that there are so many strategies for actually moving through that, that it's not just, let's just talk about it or something, right? It's, um, it is actually more of these physical types of responses that can help. And we're, I'm not like downplaying therapy, obviously, I think therapy is great. But, um, but it is something where I feel like the physical element, a lot of times isn't really looked at as much because people are like, well, it was an emotional experience, or it was a mental experience. So I'll focus on the mental stuff. But the the body really does um, hold on to that and re respond to it. And if you're not dealing with the body as well, I'm sure a lot of longer term health issues can come up. Um, you mentioned eating disorders, and I know that you also work with a fair number of clients that have struggled with eating disorders. I know there's a lot of connection between the gut and eating disorder history. Um, and in my experience working with clients, sometimes it's not always clear which came first because there is a lot of research showing that, you know, the development of an eating disorder can create a gut issue. And then there's also research showing that a gut issue can then drive eating disorder behavior. So what's your experience with eating disorder clients and how and if, like, I don't, I don't know if you'd necessarily do this. I have a feeling you do based on the way that you are so passionate about gut health. Um, but is there anything that you end up seeing? You, you mentioned stress a lot. Is there anything else that you end up seeing a lot in your eating disorder clients when it comes to their gut that needs attention and needs work more so than someone without an eating disorder? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
you know, I think going back to some of these, the basics, you know, around around gut health, like getting into a five R protocol with um, a lot of my patients who have eating disorders. You know, not only are we working around, you know, first of all, supporting them with adequate intake. You know, oftentimes that you know restrictive component to that that accompanies so many people who have eating disorders. Um, you know, that can really impact things like gut motility and promote nutrient deficiencies that can also, you know, impact gut health. Um, so, you know, we're always, I'm always trying to help support them with just adequate intake as like, you know, strategy number one, but then, you know, from there, there's, there's a lot of, um, different, I don't know, um, interventions and techniques, um, and, you know, sometimes really strategic, you know, food as medicine interventions that we'll utilize to help support them with repairing their gut and repairing that mucosal lining of the gut, also re-inoculating their gut, um, you know, with healthy microbes. And again, this is, you know, highly individualized depending on who the person is. Um, and then, you know, we also have to really, for so many, for so many patients who have had disordered eating behaviors or eating disorders for a long time, again, it's really kind of delving into what might be happening, you know, at meals with, you know, motility, with digestive support. And that's where, you know, oftentimes doing testing can really help us to get a you know better picture of you know what their what their gut health and digestive health looks like um and if they have like many many patients who have eating disorders have underlying SIBO as well or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth so you know if that's not treated and like you said it's kind of this whole chicken and egg scenario of like which one came first so if that's not treated then you know they're going to continue to have you know, potentially horrible constipation and, and bloating, and they're not going to feel like eating. And, you know, and you're just, you're always kind of, you know, banging your head against the wall with just trying to move forward with treatment for both the gut and the eating disorder. So again, you know, using that kind of root cause analysis to under, you know, like discovering and pulling back the layers on, you know, what's really underlying this. And then, using it's through a very nuanced lens lens of being able to work with both the gut issue and the eating disorder simultaneously. Mm -hmm. A couple of minutes ago, you mentioned the five R protocol. Can you take like a 30,000 foot view what that is? So our audience knows what you're talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So the five R protocol, it's, um, it's kind of one of the standard, I guess, in the world of, you know, integrative and functional medicine, it's like, it's the standard approach that we use for, um, treating gut issues. So in the first R, hopefully I get these in the right order is remove. And that remove can be removing, you know, a potential pathogenic, um, you know, source of gut dysfunction, things like, you know, bio, you know, bacteria, you know, candida, even things like H. pylori, fungal overgrowth, parasites. Um, so we're going to try and like remove whatever that, you know, unwanted, you know, pathogenic bacteria might be. Also in the, in the remove, you know, phase of the five R protocol, we're also looking at removing foods that might be offensive, um, or might be, you know, worsening your symptoms. So that might be foods that are, you know, high in FODMAPs. It might be gluten. It might be lactose. There's, you know, high sulfur foods. There's a lot of different strategies that we, that, you know, that would have to be personalized for somebody to really identify what, you know, potential food triggers might be for them. The second R is the re-inoculate phase where using, you know, supplement strategies or using, you know, food as medicine strategies, we're going to try to re-inoculate the gut and support the gut with, you know, the healthy bacteria. Those, you know, we're going to try and support the commensal bacteria, those bacteria that, you know, naturally reside and belong there. And in doing so, we're going to try to increase the diversity and the abundance of those bacteria. Um, third R is repair. So, you know, again, there's a lot of supplement strategies that can be used to help you repair the lining of the gut and to support healthy gut mucosa. Um, 
Fourth is replace. So we're going to replace things like motility agents, promote digestive support for people at mealtime so that they can break down food and, um, and have, you know, fewer, you know, potentially, you know, fewer symptoms associated with, you know, foods that they're maybe, you know, not that are causing fermentation in the gut, for instance. And then the final R is the rebalance, or some people will say the relax, which is again, you know, that whole connection to managing and reducing stress, you know, that connection to the, you know, vagus nerve, um, you know, you know, supporting sleep, um, the use of things like potentially like adaptogens, supporting the HPAT access. So, um, so it's just this really comprehensive, you know, approach to identify, to, I guess, targeting and identifying like what somebody needs in each of these different aspects to support a healthy gut. Awesome. And earlier you were talking about how you got into the world of gut health and the experience that you had helping your husband get healthier. And um, before we hit record, we were talking about how you have a special passion for helping people with IBSD specifically. And I'm curious, is there anything that someone with chronic diarrhea, IBSD, is there anything they need to do differently to support their gut than maybe they've um, heard from just overall gut health recommendations? Well, um, you know, I think anybody who has IBSD, the first thing you really have to do, and again, this can be a kind of a daunting task, and which is why it's, I think, best to work with somebody who has training in gut health and training in integrative and functional medicine is you have to identify, first of all, what is the root cause to your IBSD? Because unless you know why you have IBSD, you know, there's really, there's no blanket, you know, treatment for anybody who has IBSD. There can be a lot, like I said, lots of different root causes. Um, it might be post-infectious IBSD where maybe you traveled abroad or maybe you ate at grandma's house for Thanksgiving and the food was left out too long and you ended up getting foodborne illness. And then, you know, ever since then, your gut just hasn't been the same, you know, that those kinds of things can happen for people, you know, all the time. Um, often, times to uh, you know a common underlying root cause of in statistically 60 percent of people who have ibs have SIBO. So being able to identify whether or not you have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and get the right testing for that. So I think that's, you know, that would be, that's one of the things that I think is the most important thing is you really have to just know what the root cause is. Cause until you do, you know, there's really, I don't know, there's, it's, it's just so hard to say what, what treatment or what intervention is going to be effective for you. Um, and then from there, you know, you kind of go through that whole five hour protocol where you're going to, for you individualize a meal plan or a diet that is going to help to, you know, potentially you're going to implement a, an elimination diet where you're going to be able to remove, remove foods that are exacerbating your symptoms. Um, you're going to, again, hopefully identify if it's something, you know, pathogenic and remove that. And then you kind of keep moving through that protocol where you're repairing your gut, you're rehealing your gut, you're re-inoculating your gut, you know, you're rebalancing everything in your, you know, with your nervous system, um, you know, identifying stress. Um, I think, you know, it's just hard to say there's not one thing that I would say if you have IBSD, this is the one thing that you need to do compared to anybody else, because there's literally, I could probably list 30 different root causes of IBSD right now. Wow. Yeah. So it sounds like the first step for everyone and especially people with IBSD is to identify the root cause or causes so that the efforts that you're making actually deal with those root causes and you're not just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing yeah. what sticks. Yes, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> now, I know that you have a free um, gift for anyone who is dealing with IBSD. Do you want to tell them about that? 
Yeah. So if you go over to um, my website, which is gutbrainrd.com, um, I have a free a free gift for people. It's the five mistakes you're making with IBS. And so in that in that in that free gift, you're going to be able to learn five different things. One of you know that that a lot of people who have IBS are um, a lot of the mistakes that people have IBS are doing, and um, hopefully you'll be able to glean a few um, pearls from that and hopefully it'll help move you along in your journey of um, recovering from from that because it's it's totally possible you don't have to live with it (laughs) (laughs) awesome well we'll make sure that the link to that guide is in the show notes for this episode and how else can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about the work that you do or possibly become one of your clients yeah. So like I said, my, my website is getbrainrd.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, which is getbrainrd. Um, those are, and those are probably the two best ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, like I said, we'll put those links in the show notes and luckily Carrie's got a pretty easy, memorable name, gut brain RD. RD stands for registered dietitian. And, um, Thank you for coming on the show today, Carrie. It was really awesome to get to chat with you about your knowledge and expertise around gut health and mental health and trauma and all the stuff that I know you're so passionate about. And um, it's nice to once in a while not just be talking about business stuff with you. (laughs) Absolutely. It's nice to get your expertise coming in my direction. I really enjoy that. (laughs) A little role reversal, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Laura. I really appreciate it. It's just been so fun to chat with you today. Yay, well, thank you. And thanks all of you for spending this 45 minutes to an hour with me and Carrie. And we will look forward to seeing you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Are you a dietitian or nutritionist business owner that wants to create an online business that attracts, converts, and serves your dream clients? then keep listening because I have a special opportunity that will help you create the profitable, joy-filled nutrition business that you always wanted. In my signature group coaching program, the Nutrition Business Accelerator, you'll learn how to start, grow, and scale your online nutrition business to six figures and beyond so you can experience the financial and time freedom that you desire. Inside the program, you'll learn how to attract high paying clients who are excited to work with you and willing to pay you the rates you deserve. You'll get training on how to effectively sell your services in a way that feels authentic and converts prospects into paying clients without feeling pushy or salesy. And you'll get step-by-step instructions on how to create programs and services that provide transformative results, leading to glowing testimonials and referrals from your current clients so you can have the greater impact that you desire in the world around you. You'll also learn how to manage your time, energy, and resources so you can get more done in less time and experience the time freedom that you started your business to experience. Want to make this your reality? The Nutrition Business Accelerator is your pathway to achieve all of this and more. Get the proven strategy that has helped dozens of business owners grow their online nutrition business to five and $10,000 months and beyond. Inside the program, you'll get mentorship and guidance from me, a compassionate coach who's built her own multi six figure online nutrition business. So that way you never have to feel stuck in your business again. I created this program to help struggling dietitian and nutrition entrepreneurs get clarity on who they serve, how they serve them and how they can stand out in a crowded market so they can more easily attract dream high paying clients into their online nutrition business. If this sounds like something you're interested in, go to lauraschoenfeldrd.com forward slash NBA to learn more about the program and get on the wait list. That's lauraschoenfeldrd.com forward slash NBA, which is short for Nutrition Business Accelerator. Doors are opening soon and you don't want to miss out on this one of a kind business coaching opportunity. Let's accelerate your nutrition business together. I'll see you in the program.